All right, let's look at an example to see why is this nearest neighbor algorithm doing so well? Because we just figured that it's like overfitting the data everywhere. And so what is it that's uh, like keeping it like so efficient? Okay, so let's look at this example where we are just like using n equals two points. So we just like have two points. And it's really easy to see that we can simply like classify it into the two classes because there is just that line that bisects. And so we have this simple linear classifier, right? And when we have three points, as is the case here, then the way this region is, is, is kind of divided or the way we get our hypotheses, it gets a little more complex because of like three points and, and like they, they might have different classes depending on whatever data that is, right? And so there is a general trend that we see as my data points are increasing. So for example, like n equals four, five, six, and so on. My hypothesis is getting complex, right? And so as like, if you remember uh, from one of the previous lectures about regularization and how regularization works. So when as like my hypothesis gets more complex, I want to make it simple by putting some conditions on it, right? And so... Uh, and also one way of thinking about it is that regularization was guiding us to a simpler hypothesis, especially when the data quality was not good or maybe the quantity of the, the data was less, right? So we needed uh, more like regularization with less data, in other words. Now, if you look at the nearest neighbor, what it's doing is that the boundary or the hypotheses, or maybe like let's think about this boundary uh, only, the, the hypothesis it's categorizing my data. Essentially, it's becoming less regularized with more data points, right? So this here, it's like really, really complex, which means it's less regularized. So in other words, like in some sense, it is self-regularizing because the final hypothesis basically is, is simpler uh, when there are fewer data points. So in itself, by, by, by its very structure, it's self-regularizing. That's what this slide tells us, like a simple boundary is used with few data points, a more complex one with only you know, like more data points. And so that's essentially what regularization does explicitly, but this is doing it implicitly. So that's why we say that the nearest neighbor is self-regularizing. All right, having said that, there is another variant of uh, the nearest neighbor algorithm. It's also known as the K nearest neighbor, and you might have come across it. There is nothing special to it, except that instead of considering a single neighbor, take k uh, neighbors, k is just like any number. So k, it'll take k number of nearest neighbors. And for simplicity, if for example, k is odd, right? Then according to this rule, k nearest neighbor, a new test point x will belong to the majority class among the k nearest data points, so to say. So basically what we're doing is like a majority vote in using like, amongst those k uh, points. So for example, for a classification problem, basically I'm checking the sign of my final, whatever that is, for those k points. That's, that's all that is to, to this. Basically, I'm doing a majority vote and taking the sign of the, the majority, right? So it's as simple as that. Instead of like considering one point and its neighbors, I'm considering k points and its neighbors. And you can see here what's going on. So obviously, k is a number as I said. And so this number could be different different numbers, right? And this is like my basic nearest neighbor where I have like one nearest neighbor. And as you remember, it like used to overfit. Why? Because uh, I have like some region for every point essentially, right? So, so look at this, right? This, this blue one here, this blue point is so intricate. And also there's a blue region here, believe it or not, for that one point, because obviously that one point is like one nearest neighbor rule. All right. So what's happening with a k value, which is like really, really small, that we are doing something like close to overfitting, right? So we are overfitting. And then there is like 21 nearest neighbor. This is just like an experiment uh, done with the digits data. And so with the 21 nearest neighbors, like you see that the decision uh, boundary is much smoother than this one. Right, so we're looking at instead of like one nearest neighbor, we're looking at 21 nearest neighbors and then doing the majority vote. Right. So based on that, you can tell that there would be a larger region of like the same class. Right. And so basically we have more like a, like a smoother separating region or smoother hypotheses or a decision boundary, if you want to what would like to call it. Obviously, in, in this case, my E in would have been zero. Right. Which would not be the case here because obviously they have like misclassified this this blue point or the blue point that was beneath here. Here we had the region for that. 
right? But here we don't have. So obviously, E n is not exactly zero. It's not guaranteed to be zero, but that's it, right? It is what it is. And then we go like further, and we see that this is like 127 points neighbor nearest neighbors, and you can tell there aren't even like two spaces based on the majority vote like the entire space is classified as minus one or this red colored whatever that is considered that is just like one class right so this you can tell is some kind of underfitting uh if, if not exactly but some kind of underfitting uh, all right so there is this entire range of k values that are kind of impacting my final hypothesis in the sense that one is like overfitting versus the, the, the other one that's underfitting. And so maybe I can look at my k as a regularizer, right? It is acting as some kind of a regularizer. Of course, that's not the spelling. And so if k is small, you have a, k, like a very complex hypothesis as the case here. If k is large, then you have like a very simple hypothesis. In fact, like not even a hypothesis, like everything is in one class if you go beyond a certain point. So obviously, I'm bound to think that there is some optimal k, some best k that exists. And how do we get that? Right. So what and, and there is a significant role of this k in this k nearest neighbor. And so let's try and understand that role of k. So the role of k is, first of all, like we really want to choose some appropriate k, right? So choose k, even before looking at the, at the role. And so one way is whenever you're dealing with these like parameters in a machine learning problem, the, the first thing that should come to your mind is how about we use validation or cross-validation? So yes, of course, you can do cross-validation and get an appropriate k. That's, that's one. But there is some theory that gives us a guideline on how to select k. And eventually we'll see that cross-validation is like a good criteria for that. But let's kind of go through the theory and then try to like determine k. Okay. So we just saw that k determines a trade-off between fitting the data and overfitting the data. So of course, true. Now, as I have like more and more data, right? So let's, this is my test point x. And let's say initially I had like only three uh, points. And then if I like keep having like generating more and more data, all your like nearest neighbors will get like whatever your nearest neighbor is, it gets closer to the test point. So basically the fraction of neighbors that are like a plus one uh, or a minus one, depending on whatever you have, are a good estimate of my pi of x, right? As I get like more and more data essentially. And so basically I'm getting, so how do we get Basically, the question here is how to get many neighbors close to the to the test point. If, if k is large, then in that case, we have something. To, so theoretically, there is a theorem that helps us kind of tell what is a guideline on selecting k as a function of n. So that's like a better way of expressing it, right? Uh, think about the intuition of this theorem before I actually go into the mathematics of the theorem. Uh, let's say there is a test point x, as I said here, this, and at a distance, and it is at a distance r from one of its like kth nearest neighbor, right? So the fraction of all the points that fall within this r of x, right, is, is k over n, and which by assumption is approaching zero as I have, have more and more data. And so as that it is approaching zero, as this k of n is approaching zero, that means my r is also approaching zero. Or in very simple terms, the k's, the k nearest neighbors to x are also approaching x. So they're really like overlapping x. They're coming really close. So this like fraction will approach my pi of x, right? The probability of, of, of plus one by the law of large numbers, right? So in other words, if k is a function of n, we, we are able to or we can recover the optimal classifier. So that's what this entire thing in simple words is telling us. As n becomes really huge, my k is also approaching uh, infinity. And then the assumption that k over n goes to zero, we just understood why it goes to uh, zero or it approaches zero rather, uh, right? So, uh, so what happens in that situation is that uh, if like for sufficiently large n, right, my E in for whatever hypotheses I have, E in of G converges to E out of G. And E out of G in turn converges to my optimal E out. So if K is a function of N and N is sufficiently large, we can recover the optimal classifier. 
Okay, so this is what this theorem is stating and I've given you a sketch of the proof, not exactly the mathematical proof, but you can tell that if n is really large, there are, there are chances that you're going to recover uh, e out when k is also large, such that like k over n, the assumption that k over n uh, uh, approaches zero also holds, right? In principle, like basically based on this like theorem, you can think that in principle you can learn and you can reach the optimal at least with some n value. And, and, and the important thing here is that choose k such that it is a function of n. Because as n is approaching to in infinity and k is a function of n, which is also approaching to infinity and, and then only this assumption holds and so on. And so, for example, so this is an example, one choice could be here k is a function of n. So let's say choose k equals square root of n, right? So it obviously follows this above theorem. k is a function of n. If n is sufficiently large, then k is also like k goes to infinity because k is a function of n and then this this will also follow and, and so my e in will eventually converge to e out and we are very close to achieving the optimal. All right. So all of this is essentially talking about choosing k. In practice, however, it is found that k equals 3 works the best. This is like is sufficient. It works really well and it converges nearly uh, optimal in most problems, in most of the known problems. Theoretically, k is square root of n, but as, like as again, again, the same logic applies, uh, and then, so theoretically k is square root of n, but but practically k equals three has been found to do really well. And then there are ways. I think in the textbook talks about like how we can kind of uh, link e in with e out when k equals three, but we're not going into that much detail. Uh, basically, the idea here is that k controls how many data po points are close to x and how close these are, right? How 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 well these are packed in here. Okay, so let us like having discussed the role of k in 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 k nearest neighbors. Obviously, let us look at uh, different outcomes on digits data. And let's say this is like my uh, data points and how this did on uh, e out, and so. The performance and various choices of k was kind of um, analyzed here and we are looking at out of sample error on some huge data set that's outside of like my, my training set. And if you can see this here is just like for reference because this is like the nearest neighbor uh, outcome when k equals one. And then with k equals three, you can see the green, uh, la the green curve and the theoretical curve is the blue one which is pretty close to my k equals three, so I don't see why we shouldn't be using k equals three. And then the cross-validation one. This is something that, that's really, uh, really, really interesting. Why? Because cross-validation is a very, very powerful approach, as you can see. And how we are using this red curve is the cross-validation one where we have a training set, construct the deficient hypotheses, remember, from the validation lecture. Evaluate on a validation set or cross-validation point, whichever we are looking at, most likely the cross-validation point. Select the best K and hence the best model, right? So the lowest cross-validation error, just like we've been doing always. So that's what we are doing here. And as you can see, the cross-validation error is like really going down with the number of data points increasing and it, it does the best like beyond a, a certain N, right? And so of course, as we already know, uh, like, like cross-validation is an extremely, extremely powerful technique and it's it's like really going down uh, beyond 1.5, which is good. And then these are quite comparable, I would say. The theoretical and k equals 3, and which is why in practice most of the times we use k equals 3. Uh, k equals 1 is also interesting. This is like just there for reference. A uh, factor of 2 worse than the rest, which is pretty close to what we found theoretically. So that's uh, obviously validating it here. So th these are different ways of choosing K, as I said. One of the most uh, common ones is using validation or cross-validation. All right. So now having like discussed what K nearest neighbor is, uh, let's actually, because we, have, we now know what's the nearest neighbor algorithm, let's compare it with a linear model. We spent quite a lot of time discussing the linear model. And so let's see how this is different or like what exactly is the difference. Well, I would say in a single word, the difference is that linear model is a parametric model. And you might have come across this, this term before. This is a parametric model and the nearest neighbor is a non-parametric model. What does that mean? You must have like already noticed that there are no, par uh, there, there are no para parameters involved with the nearest neighbor. Basically, you just get the data 
and then you're ready to go like based on whatever k value you have you decide uh, okay this belongs to this class versus this belongs to the other class you're not really fitting any parameters right and if you think about the linear model we have like these d plus one parameters uh, and of course uh, the good thing here is like you if you like just compare them so the parameters are like whatever you learn so my weights are my parameters essentially right and i keep the weights so now the good thing in the linear model is that i don't have to keep the data once i've learned from the data and and if you think about like what we perceive learning as not real learning was happening here i just have the data and i'm like classifying based on whatever my k is but here we've like learned from the data i can just like throw away the data right and just like keep the weights just keep the weights and then based on the weights i decide uh, what my new point is going to be so basically no matter what the data i'm like i'm just like after getting that hyperplane which in many situations as you can see here is a line right so i'm getting the hyperplane and that's about it so in that sense this is also considered rigid it's not as flexible right so no matter what the data was i'm just like getting that hyperplane and that's about it all right um here this is more generic applies to any problem it's really flexible as per the data there aren't many limitations here uh, and and we also theoretically prove that we can get uh, near optimal performance with large n right because of the relationship and and the and the analysis that we did earlier we know that we can achieve optimal which is great here right and so that's why this is generic this one is specialized well specialized it, it's like uh and like we understand that this can this is not generalized for every problem but we saw uh, that we can solve a lot of problems i would say and this is also giving us a tight link between e in and e out which we are not getting here and of course we are getting we are saying we are we are achieving the optimal e out with a certain n uh which is wasn't the case here but this this is giving us a more i would say uh tangible sort of relationship between e in and e out uh, okay and as we said this is like more flexible uh, one uh, drawback and we'll talk about that more i think in the coming lecture uh, as far as i remember is that like i have to keep the data here right and and i can throw away the data here so that means that that might have issues with the resources that i'm i'm, I'm using to apply this nearest neighbor as we shall see going forward right so in, in that in that sense this might be uh, not as good as the linear model but then again it depends on the problem and, and depends on on the data and and so on right uh, all right so this is like a comparison between the nearest neighbor and the the fundamental difference between the nearest neighbor and the linear model is that the nearest neighbor is a non parametric approach uh, we are not really uh, like learning any parameters from the data uh, okay so moving on here is another example and this is just like to demonstrate that nearest neighbor can extend to multi class problems as well not just like two class problem that we've been looking until now but rather to to this one uh, all right uh, okay so so here like the only thing that you just have to remember is that assume similar points are in close proximity to one another and hence belong to that same class so we here we have the data the digits data and you can see until now we've been using only two classes so remember 1 and 5 but here we have the entire uh, data in, in the sense that we have all the digits and each is its own class so basically we have 10 classes here right and nearest neighbor really works well on multi class problems as you can see it's like really pretty seamless you can say here uh, with with multi class problems and here what we are doing and we have the confusion matrix here uh, i don't know if we introduced the confusion matrix before i don't quite remember so confusion matrix is essentially telling us what we did with the uh, with our model and what we predicted and what it actually was right so for example so this is the percentage uh, times when when it was a zero and indeed we said yes it is a zero so predicted zero and it's correct the other times like we predicted something else and so obviously it was wrong right so the accuracy would obviously be calculated by just like summing up um, the diagonal elements for every class which is like nothing but the, the 10 digits and so we're getting 41% accuracy uh, which well is decent i wouldn't say like it's the best we can definitely try to get better by using maybe better features i don't know because here we are still like stuck with the same average intensity symmetry maybe we can come up with with better features and as you can see the the decision boundary for each of these and this here is a is zero which is quite understandable that intensity is high symmetry is also uh, quite high one doesn't have a lot of intensity but symmetry seven 
low on um, symmetry, but yeah, okay, intensity or even low on that and so on. So, so you can see like we, we do get like these this, these uh, decision boundaries and in multi-class problem as well, this, this does quite well. Uh, think about it as a 10 class problem. And if you just pick any random uh, classifier, uh, the, the the best it can, like any random classifier without thinking about anything else will still have a 10% accuracy. So this is definitely better than that random classifier. So we can say that it's not that bad, actually. And as I said, we can definitely improve from here, thinking more about the features and how can we get the most when we are like looking at it as a multi-class problem as, as opposed to like the one and five that we were looking earlier. Uh, so this this gives us a, a, a definitely gives us an okay I would say okay kind of a result here uh, with a multi class problem. Uh, all right. So having said that, let's summarize this nearest neighbor or like k nearest neighbor rather. So the very first advantage I would say of the k nearest neighbor is it's simple. It's just like get the all you need is the data and then then you're done. Right. You don't have an iterative procedure wherein you're uh, doing multiple things or multiple steps. It's just like very simple. There is no training involved, and so it doesn't really look like we are learning. But the good thing is uh, we, we have the ability to reach near optimal when n is sufficiently large. We shouldn't forget this. Sufficiently large and easy to justify classification to customer. Well, in like real world problems, it's easy for us to go ahead and, and describe it to the customer, like what's what's really going on here. Right, because we have to like justify why we came with this result versus the other one, and 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 we'll see going forward like a lot of uh, machine learning models, a lot of AI models, uh, of like find less implementation in the real world because of this this point. Like it's not easy to justify why we came up with this solution, right? And so th th this is really easy to justify. I can say, okay, the majority class is, is close to this point. So many, uh, like, K number of points lie close to this point and so on, especially for problems like in finance and, and, and medicine and so on, right? So it's easy to justify to the customer, easy to, to explain. And so that's why this is, like, really easy to uh, use, essentially. You can easily do multi-class, as we just saw with the digits data, of course. We can have as many uh, classes as, as, as we would like because all we are doing is, like, really looking at the majority class for a new test point, and then based on that, deciding our decision boundary. All right, uh, we can uh, use it and we can adapt it for logistic regression or uh, for re normal regression. And that's because like we've been using the classification problem. So instead of sign, just take the average directly, right? Just take the average and see uh, the, the how the new point, like where exactly it lies and what's the average of those points and just like, uh, get the hypotheses. Similar to that, we can do logistic regression. So basically compute the fraction of plus ones. That's it, right? So this is like the indicator function telling like what fraction of plus ones lie in this region versus um, that depending on like whatever the value of k. So instead of like applying the sine function to this g of x, I can just directly go and do the indicator function. So both are, are doable and that's that's really good. Now, I would say like before ending this lecture that there are two drawbacks to the nearest neighbor. And although we pointed only one here, which is like it is computationally demanding. Why? Because I'm all the time I need uh, uh, like all the data and which is why it's not so popular in practice. And we'll address that in the next lecture, actually. Uh, but but that's like one of the important disadvantages. I would also say this this thing, although we proved that we can achieve near optimal, but this is also somehow a limitation in the sense that I don't know what is like sufficiently large n, and I can I cannot know that because it depends on a lot of other factors. So uh, obviously this is a, a simple uh, algorithm that does not require training and, and easy to use, easy to justify. All of that is great, but uh, as I said. There are these two uh, drawbacks that we're going to address uh, most likely in the next lecture. So this, I'll conclude this lecture with this. Uh, thank you.